Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you again. Thank you all for coming. The weather is horrible right now. Um, welcome to the first event of Think, Drink, Mingle, the Century Foundation Summer Series for Young Professionals. Tonight's conversation will describe the troubling and confusing state of higher education today and will offer a look at where we go from here to make sure future generations have fair, affordable post-secondary opportunities. Today, access to higher education is not presented in an, in an equitable manner. From the trickery of for-profit institutions to national yearly increases in tuition, the student of a lower socioeconomic background is left with no chance of continuing their education without going into debt. That being said, the higher education system is failing our youth. It is failing because it is following the capitalist structure and providing education as a service in exchange for the dollar rather than treating education as a right of the citizen. It's just plain wrong, and we are not the only people who feel this way. Small steps are being made across the country in New York with its free tuition program, and most recently, the University of Michigan, which is set to provide to free tuition for in-state students who come from a family who earns $65,000 or less in annual income. These initiatives will be beneficial to some students of these specific states, but these programs will be best if applied on a national level. It is necessary for us to continue and carry the dialogue that we have today with us in our, in our professional and scholastic paths because we will be the change. Bringing attention to the inequality of higher education will lead to legislative reform and fresh initiatives that will level the playing field of post-secondary education. The all-star speakers that are with us this evening specialize in the topic of equal higher education. Let's give them all a hand. First, we have Sarah Goldrick Rabb. Sarah Goldrick Rabb is a professor of higher education policy and sociology at Temple University and also the founder of the Wisconsin Hope Lab, the nation's only translational research laboratory seeking ways to make college more affordable. Dr. Goldrick Rabb's commitment to scholar activism is evidenced by her broad profile of research and writing on the College for All movement in the United States. Her study focuses on financial aid policies, welfare reform, transfer practices, and a range of interventions aimed at increasing college attainment among marginalized populations. Not only has she been widely published in prominent education outlets, but her latest book, Paying the Price, College Costs, Financial Aid, and the Betrayal of the American Dream, is an Amazon bestseller and has been featured on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, in the New York Review of Books, on C-SPAN's book, TV, among other venues. In 2013, she was invite, invited to testify before the United States Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, chaired by Senators Tom Harkin and Lamar Alexander. Dr. Goldrick Rabb is also the recipient of several prestigious awards and honors. In 2014, she received the Early Career Award from the American Educational Research Association, and in 2015, she graduated from the William T. Grant Foundation's five-year-long faculty scholars program. In 2016, Politico magazine named her one of the top 50 people shaping American politics. Thanks for being with us tonight, Dr. Kojic Rabb. Can we all give her applause, please? <laughs> Next, we have Kimberly Quick. Kimberly Quick is a policy associate at the Century Foundation working on education policy in our DC office. Kimberly graduated summa, summa cum laude from Wake Forest University in 2014 with a bachelor's degree in politics and international affairs and minors in English and American ethnic studies. Prior to joining the Century Foundation, Kimberly completed a fellowship at the office of the provost at Wake Forest where she helped develop the university's communications programming and policy related to diversity and inclusion and in student experiences. She has also interned and volunteered with the American Bar Foundation, the Federal Trade Commission, and Amnesty International. Can we please welcome Kimberly? <laughs> and lastly, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Richard Kallenberg. He is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation specializing in education, civil rights, and equal opportunity. He has been called the intellectual father of the economic integration movement in K-12 schooling and is an authority on teachers unions, private school vouchers, charter schools, 
turnaround school efforts, labor organizing, and inequality in higher education. His articles have been widely featured in many reputable outlets and has appeared on countless mainstream news channels. He is the author of six books, most recently, A Smarter Charter, Finding What Works for Charter Schools and Public Education, which he co-authored with TCF Education Fellow Hallie Potter. Previously, Richard was a fellow at the Center for National Policy, a visiting associate professor for constitutional law at George Washington University and a legislative assistant to Senator Charles Robb of Virginia. He currently serves on the advisory board of the Pell Institute, the Albert Shanker Institute, and the research advisory panel of the National Coalition for School Diversity. Please join me in welcoming our speakers for the evening. Thank you all. Well, can you guys hear me? Good? Okay. Thank you, Razik, for that introduction, um, particularly the very powerful first part of the introduction. Um, and thanks, Sarah and Rick, for, for being here and engaging in this conversation with me. Um, I wanted to start, given the theme of the evening, by asking each of you to reflect on what a fairer system of higher education should look like in America. Um, specifically, what immediate action we would need to take to achieve some of this, um, and what long-term systemic changes there need to be made to achieve this. And either so one you, of you can start. Okay, well, I'll, I'll say a couple of words. Um, uh, I basically, I guess, a fair system would look very different than what we have today. Uh, right now, if you're in the richest uh, portion of the population, you have about a 70% chance of getting a bachelor's degree. If you're in the poorest, uh, you have an 8% chance of getting a bachelor's degree by the age of 24. Uh, I think we fundamentally have a separate and unequal system, and Sarah and I have both um, uh, written about this and in some cases collaborated on trying to address the issue. So on the one hand, we have kind of the, the elite four-year institutions that get a lot of press in the New York Times and elsewhere. Uh, and there you have rich kids outnumbering poor kids by 24 to 1, right? You run into 24 rich kids for every low-income student that, uh, that you see on those, those campuses. There have been some positive efforts to address racial diversity, very, very little to address uh, socioeconomic diversity on these campuses. Um, on the other uh, X hand, you have community colleges where uh, low-income students outnumber wealthier students by about two to one. Uh, and on the one hand, that's kind of the crowning glory of the system, that they are open access and provide opportunities for uh, more disadvantaged populations. Um, but on the other hand, they, because they are separate and predominantly poor, uh, tend not to get funded the way that we fund the four-year colleges. And Sarah and I were part of a meeting earlier today to address that very question of uh, what sort of resources do community colleges need to, uh, to make sure that they can do a good job of educating uh, disadvantaged students. Uh, you know, the community colleges are supposed to be the place where we educate the aspiring middle class and, and we're not doing a very good job of that right now. So, so that's essentially what I would uh, suggest we have, separate and unequal institutions for, for rich and poor and for, for white and minority. So we've got a lot of, uh, we've got our work cut out for us. So I would agree with all of that. Um, I would say, I have, I have little kids, so I get asked all the time, what's fair? <laughs> or I get told mm -hmm. that isn't fair. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, what's fair? In education and in this country, we tell ourselves all the time that we work hard and we get good things, right? Work hard pays off and, and, and being talented pays off. And yet today, we have a system where all the hard work in the world and all the talent in the world hardly guarantees you a shot at a college education. In fact, you're better off, instead of being really smart and working hard, choosing when you're born to have wealthy parents, which as we all know, we're not so good at doing in terms mm -hmm. of choice, right? And so, and yet we, by the way, continue to tell ourselves when we watch people get into college that they got in there on their own merits. 
right? I mean, just the other day, when I watched the rollout of the Michigan uh, plan that was referenced earlier, I saw a very prominent economist who tweeted, well, from now on, uh, getting into the University of Michigan will be about your talent, not the family you're born into. If you actually think that making college tuition free at the University of Michigan does that for a person, then you really don't understand how unfair the educational system currently is. Because the odds of getting qualified to be admitted based on what they think it is required in order to succeed, right, is stacked by family income as well. The other thing that would be fair in higher ed, as it is in all levels of K-12 education, is that where people need the most resources to move ahead, right, where it will take the most to move a student from point A to point B, is where we would put most of the money. That wouldn't just be fair, that would actually be cost effective. And in higher ed, as Rick alluded to, we do the complete opposite, where we pile on money upon dollars upon dollars upon dollars upon dollars lavishing those at places like our most elite institutions with $60,000 to $90,000 a year educations. I mean, we even put that on our website. We spend $90,000 a year on somebody who got high test scores in high school to educate them at the college level, while we spend barely $10,000 a year and sometimes less on people who may not have even learned to read or write when they were in high school, and college is their only chance. So it's a, it's a fundamentally unfair system, but I also want to point out, it's not a cost-effective system either. We're wasting a lot of money. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Rick, for that. Um, Sarah, I wanted to ask you a, a question about some of your previous work. So in 2014, you and your colleague, Nancy Kendall, wrote a proposal for the Lumina Foundation um, that dealt with the issue of free college. Um, so this was before the 2016 primaries, but a lot of these issues reemerged during that time. Um, and in that, in that um, proposal, you would funded college for two years, and you did not means test who was eligible for it. So I wanted to ask you to describe that program and then describe why you made some of those choices and how you think that contributes to a fair opportunity to, to achieve at college. So um, as a little bit of background for those of you who don't know the Lumina Foundation, right? it's one of these prominent higher ed foundations that tries to advance uh, the agenda, reforming higher education, et cetera. And they asked a set of us to think about ways to make college affordable. They asked a you know, set of experts, what are the different things you would want to put forward to make college affordable? And so some of my colleagues put forth you know, income-based repayment plans of various sorts. Um, other people put forward a state-federal partnership for funding higher education. Uh, my colleague and I took this opportunity to do something we'd been talking about for a while, which was to say, come on, just make it free. Okay, and we did that not in a naive way. So Nancy studies uh, comparative education around the world, including in some of the most uh, vulnerable countries, and watches as, for example, women are denied education in all sorts of places where they really need it for their basic survival. Okay, and I spent a number of years studying our financial aid system. So I had looked up close at what we tell people they're gonna get from financial aid that is delivered based on a means test, right? Based on that FAFSA. Anybody got familiar with the FAFSA? Small American bureaucratic tragedy. Okay, I think it's a disaster. All right, so, so I spent a lot of time uh, really up close with financial aid recipients trying to understand how that system worked. And so sitting there to sit down and write this paper, we were wrestling with all of those things, okay, as backdrop. And what we decided that we would call for was essentially making grades 13 and 14 free. We didn't call them in that paper grades 13 and 14, and I've wrestled with whether we ought to. Because at some point, remember, there wasn't even a grade nine, right? I mean, if we go back to how education has been made free in this country and public, and also admittedly, yes, compulsory, right, in K-12 education, you gotta remember it wasn't always like this. And we made a set of decisions to expand those levels as we decided that our economy and our society, our democracy needed it. So we called for two years. And the reason for that is because that's actually where most people get stuck, right? If you're not gonna make it through college, it usually happens in those first two years. The most inequality is actually there, okay? In a sense, you've got great privilege if you're going for a four-year degree in the first place. I wasn't calling for, um, by the way, free community college. Grades 13 and 14 were anywhere in the public sector. 
two year or four year, understanding that it is more efficient to start at a four year if you're going for a bachelor's degree. That was one thing. Another thing about it, yes, there was no means test. And the thinking was this, why is the Pell Grant so poor? Okay, the Pell Grant is a very poor program. We are fighting to keep it right now, but let's be honest, it is a shadow of what it was intended to be. It fails people every day. It's not an excuse for cutting it right now. I just want to be very clear, okay? But it's not up to the job, and that is because it is a program for poor people, and programs for poor people are poor programs. Any time that we segregate folks in a program, especially people that politically we just don't care as much about, okay, then we do not sustain it. The purpose of bringing everybody in under a non-meats-tested plan is to make it universal so everybody's got a stake in it. You know, look at what's happening in D.C. right now, all the things they want to cut. But nobody's saying, let's make people pay for high school. Okay? They might erode the quality of it and do other sorts of things, but they're not doing that. Um, so that was another important part. And one other component that I want to highlight was we did not call for free tuition only. Okay? We called for the whole thing. Living costs all in. And that's partly because I've had a big, robust body of research for several years now on living expenses, how they are the single biggest barrier that students face, that we have a growing number of homeless and hungry college students. I called for free tuition with a grant, a stipend, that was provided to cover living expenses, along with 10 hours a week at a livable wage okay, that students would essentially earn. That was the, quote, skin in the game part. Because the truth is, we've always worked our way through college. And yes, it does work. It's just that it doesn't work anymore. So that was with the contours of that plan. And yeah, I took it to DC. I took it to the Domestic Policy Council of the White House. And they smiled at me. I didn't know what that meant. But I did not know that 11 months later, President Obama would get out there on a vine, literally, you know, a vine, and announce that we were going to have free community college. And I went, that's so cool. And that's kind of not what I meant. Um, so let's carry on a little bit. And, and you're, the last part of your conversation where you were talking about the additional costs. So college is not just tuition. It's housing. It's food. Um, I, let's talk a little bit about aspects of the social safety net that we need to strengthen in order to maximize opportunities and outcomes for current and aspiring college students? And that's a question that either one of you can answer. OK, well, I'll take that first. Um, so look, there's multiple things that support you going to school, right? So think back to K-12 education. Yeah, we didn't charge you tuition. But also, if your family couldn't afford to send you with lunch every day, there was this thing called the National School Lunch Program. And it's one of the single biggest anti-poverty, anti-child poverty fighting efforts we have in this country. We do have a Secretary of Education who said recently there's no such thing as a free lunch. There is. And it really works. Okay, The quality of the food is widely variable. I know all about all that. But we've been providing it, and for good reason. And then we've been expanding it. So now it's got a breakfast, right? And it's got a backpack program. And here in New York, I've been watching all this discussion about how do we cover people during the summer. That program abruptly ends when a person leaves high school. Why? What sense does that make? Do they suddenly have enough to eat when they go to community college or any other college? We do the same thing with transportation. We often provide free transportation to K-12 students. Disappears. I've been here in New York City with community college students in front of me going, I did not know that was going to happen. I did the right thing, right? I graduated. I went on to college. You took everything that I leaned on away from me, OK? So there's a whole bunch of stuff. Housing, don't even get me started. Housing is actually more difficult to secure subsidized housing if you're a college student than if you aren't, creating a disincentive to actually be full time in college. So we could do a lot to work around those issues. And the last one that I'll raise, which is not technically a social safety net issue, but is a huge driver of the trouble that today's college students have, is our minimum wage. The fight for 15 is so important. We could get more people completing college by reducing the number of hours they work by raising that minimum wage. Think about how efficient that would be. Do you want to add anything, Rick? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I mean, the, what's frustrated me in, the, in talking about community college, uh, how to improve community, the work of community colleges, is that you hear all the time, you know, we need to do better with fewer resources. 
And Sarah's opening up the door and saying, that is absurd. How can we expect better results when students are hungry, when they don't have proper housing, uh, when they don't have transportation to, to get to, to school? Because the vast majority of, of community college students obviously don't live on, on campus. And so these are enormous inequities. And we can't expect to see real change in the outcomes uh, unless we have better uh, resources. Uh, just to add one, uh, one point on this, you know, if you look at the outcomes in community colleges, 81% uh, of first time uh, community, entering community college students say that they would like to ultimately get a four year degree. That's what their goal is. After six years, only 12% do so. And we think of the community college sector as, as efficient because it's, you know, we're, it's less expensive for the taxpayer than a four year, supporting a four-year institution. That's got it completely backward. Because we're uh, investing so little in community colleges, we have huge rates of, of failure. And uh, you know, we're, we're penny wise and pound foolish. That's right. I'll complement that with these statistics, which now I think we have to say alongside the completion statistics, which is that an estimated one in five to one in three community college students is hungry, low, very lowest levels of food insecurity. Okay, one in two is housing insecure, and an estimated 14% now from two different studies nationwide are homeless. We get what we pay for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was going to switch gears a little bit and, and ask you, Rick, if you could comment on um, changes that admissions committees can make um, in selective institutions um, to make admissions in higher education more fair. Um, particularly, you, you cited some, some statistics earlier and you've cited them before in your previous work um, around elite universities right. and the very low numbers of low income and disadvantaged students in elite universities. So what are right. some strategies that those universities yep. can employ? Yep. Um. Well, that's a great question. And, and Sarah made the point about the University of Michigan program. Some of you may have heard about this. They're saying if you make less than sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars $65,000, then you don't have to pay any uh, tuition. Uh, you still have to pay your, your room and board. But, um, but the point was that that was going to open the doors uh, to disadvantaged students. And that ignores the role of admissions because, in fact, elite universities uh, systematically uh, make sure that there are very, very few uh, students from uh, modest backgrounds at these institutions. Recently, Raj Chetty, who's at Stanford, uh, put out some data suggesting that at several of these elite universities, there are more students from the top 1% than from the bottom 60% by income. I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary. Uh, and it, it has to do with you know, what counts in admissions. There was a study recent, uh, not a little while ago by William Bowen, uh, former president of Princeton. And he was able to, to run the regressions and find out, well, what counts in admissions? Um, uh, and every university will say, we have holistic admissions. We look at the whole individual. And uh, you know, th there are lots of factors that go into who's admitted and who's not. But Bowen found the biggest preference. Anyone, anyone have an idea of what the biggest preference is? Uh, wh which category uh, benefit? Are you, you're, you're scratching your, yes. So, yeah, I'm actually, um, something like habitus or the way you present yourself and talk? Well, I think that's, that's part of the larger uh, picture, but uh, it turns out that, you know, athletic preferences mm -hmm. are the biggest one. Um, and one would think that that might help um, more disadvantaged students in certain sports. But it turns out that at these elite universities, at least, they're giving lots of preferences in college admissions for the squash team, the polo team. I mean, it's, uh, the, the net effect is to, to help advantaged students. Uh, uh, they do provide a leg up for underrepresented minorities to their credit. And so your, your chances of admission increase by 28 percentage points if you're an underrepresented minority. So that's African American and Latino. Uh, legacies, the children of alumni, get a 20 percentage point boost. And what that means is that if based on your academic record you have a 50% chance of getting in, now you have a 70% chance of getting in if you're, if you're a, a legacy. Uh, 
And so it, it, on it goes. Um, and then every, university, every elite university will say they give a big bump up for disadvantaged students. And it turns out being from the bottom income quartile has no positive effect whatsoever on your, your admissions. And so they set up a system where the people who've had all sorts of advantages in life, of course, are going to look better on paper academically. Uh, and there's very little consideration of what obstacles a student has had to overcome. Um, so you asked me to be hopeful, right, or, or to have I mean, solutions. You, you, can, you um, can be, yeah. So we've been, we've been pretty <laughs> negative here. Um, so uh, one thing that I found fascinating is that in states where uh, race-based affirmative action has been banned, uh, universities, to their credit, have not simply given up on diversity, but rather shifted their emphasis. And they have sought to... Uh, you know, make sure that there's going to be racial and ethnic diversity without counting race per se by uh, looking at economic disadvantage. And so we see uh, a number of these institutions saying, well, we're going to allow more students to transfer from community colleges because that's uh, an important uh, source of, of, um, of diversity. And these are students who are amazing, right? They've, uh, they've overcome odds and, and done pretty well despite the obstacles. Uh, they give a preference based on, on socioeconomic disadvantage at many of these universities. Uh, some of them have gotten rid of legacy preferences, the unfair, what I've called affirmative action for the rich, uh, where the children of alumni get in. Um, and, and so we've seen a number of steps in those institutions uh, where, uh, where race has been banned, that they, in fact, are, are reaching out to disadvantaged students of all races um, in order to provide uh, those opportunities. Thanks. Um, so we have a lot of young people, students, former students, aspiring students here um, tonight. So I wanted to ask both of you guys to comment some on what policy should students and young people organize around to create the change and improve access and opportunity in higher education. I'll give you a few of my favorites. Um, I hope it's clear that I do support the fight for 15 and that it could achieve a lot of different things. So I think that that's, I think that's one. I think anything, any policy that would essentially expand what we do in K-12 with tuition to higher education is a good thing. I'm putting it that way because actually New York's, pro not proposal now, legislation, doesn't. What New York does right, is first, it's income tested. And so you still have this issue of, of haves and have nots. You've still divided the political base of the program, I think. But also, New York is saying to you, after you go to college here, you owe us. You have to live and work in New York. You could choose to be unemployed. They're very clear about that. But if you're going to work, you better not work in New Jersey, Connecticut, any number of these places. That's not what we do in K-12 education, and it's a, there's a reason for it. We make investments in our people, and we hope that it pays off. We don't then constrain them for a number of years afterwards. You know, God forbid that somebody fall in love and move across the country to live with a new spouse or take care of a grandmother or take a job in another state. No, now we owe New York. Um, another favorite one that I think we should really be pushing for is the expansion of the National School Lunch Program into higher education. Right? I mean, I think this is very, very common sense. Um, students ha are leading a movement around the country to get their universities to stop gouging them on the prices for food on campus and to donate, in a sense, the swipes that are unused from all those meal plans to other students. And there's an organization called Swipe Out Hunger, which is doing a really masterful job of convincing institutions that it's in their economic and their just generally best interest to be engaging in that. Um, I think the other thing is in K-12 schools, we now finally have legislation that mandates that K-12 schools have point people who are charged with helping homeless youth, okay? I mean, the number of homeless youth in this country, the number of unaccompanied minors, it's incredible at this point. And they're coming to college, and that is, in a sense, a good thing because they know there's no other way out than to continue to pursue their education, but there is no mandate that colleges and universities have what we call a single point of contact, a person who has any clue about what it is to be homeless, to direct them to services. Most colleges and universities go, 
not only is that not our job, but we don't think we have any of those students. Even though, by the way, we don't ask a single question of any student in college at most places to assess if they are or are not housing secure. So those are the, those are the sorts of things that you could push for. And by the way, you can do so as alumni. If you knew somebody in college who went through something like this, I'd argue you're even more powerful as an alumni to give that feedback to your institution to tell them that they need to take care of their students. Yeah, and I'll just add that I, you know, I think there's a role for student activism across the, the spectrum. So at community colleges, uh, there tends to be um, less activism, or at least less visible activism. If you're working three jobs while you're trying to get yourself through college, it's understandable. Um, but there ought to be outrage over the fact that the, uh, we systematically underfund community colleges, therefore um, you know, setting up a system where low levels of success are not at all surprising. I mean, Maryland is one example where written into the state statute, it says we're going to fund each community college student at 25% of the rate of four-year college students. Um, that ought to be uh, something that people go, go into the streets about. Um, at the uh, more elite colleges, uh, we're starting to see some really interesting activism. And Sarah and I were, were at a conference uh, not long ago at Harvard where uh, there were a whole group of uh, first-generation students. These are the first uh, generation to be uh, a college, headed to college, and, and they were embracing this as uh, a badge of honor. Um, when I was in college, uh, the classmates who got financial aid were often um, quiet about it, embarrassed about it. There's something going on that's very exciting where students are seeing, you know, actually I haven't had everything handed to me, and therefore uh, I ought to be proud of the fact that I'm the first in my family to go to college. Uh, and there, uh, there was, to me, this, this beautifully diverse crowd, um, all students of all different races and ethnicities, bound together by their uh, common interest in making sure that the system was more fair for disadvantaged students, um, which I found, I found super inspiring. I'd love to see more of that. And they're protesting policies on campus that exclude uh, disadvantaged students and, and suggesting reforms. I think we might have time for one more question, or should we go to? Okay, okay. Um, this is my boss back there. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Sarah, I wanted to. We talked a little bit about this this afternoon, and I, I think this is a valuable conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you about expected family contribution um, and how we think about that. So, for for those of you that might be unfamiliar, expected family contribution is just very much what it sounds like. It's the amount in financial aid that the, that the student's family is expected to contribute to college. Um, how, do, how might we rethink this concept to account for students that aren't being supported by their families or that might actually really should have a negative <laughs> expected family contribution because they have to support or send money back to their families? Yeah. Okay, so I think this is an example of how higher ed misunderstands the modern American family. I, you know, I mean, once upon a time, it dealt with very different families, right? It dealt with very privileged families who mainly sent their boys to school. It deals with a very different family now. It deals with the same families that K-12 education deals with, and that means that they're complicated, and it means that their resources are strapped. I mean, we're hearing more and more, not just about the working class having trouble, right? The middle class is strapped. Um, we have fewer homes that can rely on two incomes. And so how do you get by in this country when resources are scarce? Well, you draw on a wider net of people. Okay? We know a lot about this. It's been studied for a long time. We, we tend to, therefore, draw on more relatives for income. We uh, go for kin, as we talk about it, where people who use your friends sort of as kinship networks to expand the number of people who can help and support you, and sometimes that includes our children, right? So more and more people are working at a younger and younger age, and the idea that that income first wouldn't, the work wouldn't stop when they went to college, we're learning that, right? 70% plus of undergraduates are working today. 
But it's also ludicrous to think that if you were supporting your family while you were in high school, that you would suddenly get a pass when you went on to college. And yet that, that again is the assumption. You know, as if the parents are gonna drive you up to college and drop you off with all kinds of gifts, and, and then they're gonna send you money and goodies when you're there. So that's what the expected family contribution says. And it's the most presumptuous language that people feel rightly insulted by. It gives some people a number they absolutely could never pay and cuts them off from aid eligibility to cover that number if they can't pay it. And the truth is you can have a negative expected family contribution. It is a real number that can be computed from all of that information you're providing on the FAFSA. We don't even make good use of the information. Because if you run it through what's called a needs analysis, if you actually do the math with all that info, we took all the time extracting from families, you would get a negative number for some people. But we don't like that number. We cast a value judgment on that number. We ignore it, we chop it off, and we call it zero. If we used that number, here's what would happen. I'm gonna pick on a specific college just for fun. I'm gonna pick on Amherst. Okay, I'm gonna pick on Amherst because it recently won a prize from the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, a million dollar prize for being so amazing at serving low income students. Okay, and that's because as we probably have all heard, if you below a certain income threshold, boy, Amherst is free. Well, if Amherst is free, then why do 28% of the Pell recipients graduating from Amherst have debt? You didn't read that number in the paper, because almost nobody knows to ask that question. But I asked that question to the financial aid officer, and the answer is 28%. Her answer as to why they have debt is because they chose to have debt. My answer to why they have debt is because they have negative expected family contributions, and you only package them down to the zero, not to the negative. The negative, the fact is that you, those are people who are sending money home to their families who have no choice or they'd have to go home to take care of their families. Those are people who are borrowing money so their parents could come to graduation. How could you go to a place like Amherst and not have your parents at your graduation? Those are not choices. So what's cool about the EFC is that it unpacks all this stuff. It, it's all, all of our assumptions about not just fairness but like who we are as families, who we are as parent or children are caught up in that higher ed policy. It has to change. I think we just need to get rid of it. Okay, thanks Sarah, that was great. <laughs> um, so we have some time for some questions from the audience um, and there will be some people coming around with mics um, and I'll just uh, call on you if you pop your hand up. Um, I don't know if anyone said this yet, but we are super impressed with this audience. Yes. Um, the it's torrential rain. rains yeah, that you all you came through. So, <laughs> yes. um, so we're, we're excited to get to your questions. Yeah. So I saw a hand right there very quickly. So right here in the, the mic. front. Hello, Sonia Thompson from Brooklyn. And I had two questions. Um, the first is, how do you calculate your argument with the proliferation of online degree programs? And then two, um, how do you craft your argument with a, the non-traditional student, including persons over 60 or early retirement that are pursuing their aspirations but still on Medicaid, Medicare, and health issues and still at the poverty level but are going to school with their children because it's a family affair? Thank you. Let me say one quick thing about online education, mm -hmm. and Sarah will have much more to say about this question, but um, uh, I worry that online education is kind of the, the community college funding model on steroids. So you see a lot of right-wing governors who are very, very enthusiastic about online education, in part because it's hard to unionize faculty, uh, and they don't like unions. Um, but also because they think that this is gonna be a way to educate uh, disadvantaged students on the cheap. Um, and so there's a, uh, y you'll hear about these aspirations that online education you know, can reach the, uh, the student in, in Kenya who's in a small uh, village and this will open up the world for him or her. Well, maybe on occasion that happens, but primarily this is a movement to, um, to try to reduce expenses. Uh, and all the research we've seen suggests that 
uh, disadvantaged students need more, not less. So I'm really worried about, about the trend overall. And, and we, we see that in the outcomes data, that um, it's, uh, they're very weak outcomes in, in most of these programs. Right, I agree. The outcomes don't look good. And they don't look good precisely for the people for whom this was supposedly intended. Right, so it's intended for the mom who, who can't leave the kids and has got to suppose, I mean, I, I, I remember I had that dream that I was gonna have two babies, they were gonna sit in my arm while I was on the computer doing my research, so I wasn't gonna pay for childcare, right? I mean, I get the idea. That's not how it works. It's not what ends up happening. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to say, look, I mean, my kids got high test scores that did great in K-12 education. They probably could get a college degree pretty quick and do it online. And we were sending them to online instead of Harvard, I'd be all for it. I mean, flip it, right? There are people who need in-person instruction who've never gotten it in a high-quality way, but those are not the people we're sending to online. So I'm very worried about it, and of course, it's predominant in the for-profit industry, and I don't think that we can separate those things in the way that some would like us to. It is a little different, by the way, also from open education, which is something that doesn't have a price tag on it, right? And there are folks who are trying to do that for the developing world in the absence of anything else. Um, I think, you know, I mean, the older students, I think, well, we're always going to have lifelong learners. I think there's a question about the extent to which, though, there are people who are pursuing further education at that age because, number one, we shredded the safety net for them, right? And number two, the, the job market's terrible for them, right? Or number three, because they dropped out earlier and they still have to finish. So there are things that maybe we could fix that would reduce the number of them because there just wouldn't need to be. Um, but then the other piece of all of it is there's a whole bunch of folks that are trying to monetize that group, which also worries me. It used to be the case you'd allow folks in your community who were older to come in and take classes for free. Now they see them as yet another market that they're going to charge money to, and that also concerns me. Sorry, it's what provides the support group for our, you know, it's our Marines, it's our Army, it's, mm -hmm. it's all those folks. Have you given any thought to how to sort of navigate that obvious sort of conflict of interest? It's a really mm -hmm. interesting point. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly know a growing number of people who think they're going to go into the military so they can get college paid for, and they don't realize that today's GI Bill is not yesterday's GI Bill. Um, something I don't think most of us really understand how these things are not equivalent. Um, I think there are a lot of interests that benefit from make, keeping college expensive. I think this is perhaps one of, right, the set of, the set of things. I mean, you could argue that bringing back the draft would be good in many respects, including more equity within who's getting put there, you know. Um, it threatens all kinds of interests, though. To, I mean, you know, one woman said to me at a meeting, you know, what's going to happen if it's free and you can get in? They're all going to come. <laughs> and all I thought was, well, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, I mean, I think we could cast it in a variety of ways. Yes. So the, so the recent Obama era rulemaking was under threat under the DeVos administration, specifically the gainful employment and borrower defense to repayment. Um, what is your reaction to that? How would you like to see those protections reworked in policy going forward, maybe ideally and realistically, given our political environment? Where's Bob Shireman? No. Yeah. <laughs> California. Well, somewhere. we don't have Bob Shireman, but we do have Mark Zuckerman. So I don't, yes. Mark, you want to, Mark, Mark is the president of the Century Foundation and worked in the Obama administration <laughs> and has given a lot of thought to these issues. <laughs> Wow, that was really a handoff. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, I know you mentioned a few things about gainful in some of your comments. I think the gainful employment rule was a step forward because I think there was a lot of abuse in the for-profit sector, and the gainful employment was trying to have criteria that was a proxy for are the students getting what they're investing. And unfortunately, this administration looks like a big U-turn based on the influence of the for-profit industry. So I just think there has to be some resistance around uh, repealing of the gainful employment rule. Not that the gainful employment rule is the only thing that needs to be done, but that's very significant. And it was gonna save the, the uh, borrowers and the taxpayers billions of dollars, and they wanna repeal it. So 
I think that's something people should pay attention to and uh, continue to resist. Yeah, I mean, it's such technical stuff, I have to say, that it doesn't surprise me that I really don't think the average person has any idea what any of that is, right? I mean, when I talk to people about what it would cost to make college free, they say, how are you going to pay for that? And I start to explain that you're sending so much of your taxpayer money to the University of Phoenix. You know, if you saw it on TV, it's probably not the college you want to go to. Right, and I think that we probably won't, I think, I mean, I've really thought about building a movement around this. We're in a city where actually there is advertising on subways and buses, et cetera, to warn people, right, about our for-profits. I'd like to see that spread. I think you're gonna need those sorts of things in order to sort of deal with the more technical pieces. Um, I think it's very clear that this is the president and the Department of Ed head who wanna open higher ed for business, and that's exactly what they're doing, and we know who's in this business and we know what they're gonna do with it. You know, it was predictable. I, I think that's mm -hmm. the one thing we can say and we know what our best response is, is to vote and then vote again and then impeach, other sorts of things, so, you know. <laughs> um, I think we're we're nonpartisan here, just for the record, right? <laughs> yeah, but I don't work for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are in the back and someone has a question, raise your hand high, I'm a little short, so I can't quite see. Okay, all the way in the back. Yes. Yep, you. Isn't the underlying debate uh, one between the Bernie Sanders education is a right wing and the Clinton Cuomo wings to uh, need, base it, need base it and um, only give it to, to people below a certain income level? Oh yeah, that's a debate. <laughs> I'm being told it's not that productive anymore. We're all gonna get in a room and work it out because all of, all of that's better than this, right? It's a real debate. I mean, I, 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 my, my biggest stunning moment of that campaign, I mean, the, 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 the moment there was, the moment the two of them were up there debating this issue, and, and then higher ed went away, by the way, like we had it and then it was just gone. They were actually having a substantive debate about whether you should make it free without means testing. And Hillary Clinton said, I don't want to pay for Donald Trump's kids to go to college. <sighs> I mean, my kids are sitting there and they're like, mommy's going to get mad. <laughs> well, that's like, can he go to Central Park? Can he go to, I mean, we have public goods. And that was such a moment where I thought, oh God, because if we're going to cede that ground, we lose a lot of other things. But this is really a debate, right? I have very smart colleagues who I like a lot who really disagree with me about this. Because, you know, low-income students are so deeply underfunded. How could we turn to do any, anything else until we fix that? My answer is, I don't think you're gonna fix that. But we don't have a lot of evidence on this point. I mean, I really want to admit that. This country has never had a moment where it did what I'm describing with this many people. Right? No country has ever done what I'm describing with this many people and with this diverse a set of people. And we have to admit that the reason that we don't want to pay for other people's children is because of what those children look like. And that's this country, right? So I think this is going to go on for a while. I liked that it was being discussed because I think 20 years of it being discussed, eventually we'll get there. Yeah, I guess I, the only thing I'd add is that I, I wish this were the central debate yeah. uh, over which which of the two proposals makes more sense, Bernie's or Hillary's? Um, that isn't uh, the debate right now. The debate right now is, do, are we going to cut work-study <laughs> programs? Are we going to have a 13% decline in education spending, as, as the president's budget suggests? So um, I think it's a really healthy and interesting debate. But uh, right now, we're, uh, we've just, we're fighting a rearguard action on preserving the programs that, that are there. I think this is probably going to be our last question. Oh, um, you, can we take two? Two, two, two more questions. Two? So, right here. you in right the front. In front of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, I'll give you the go first. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll go quickly, hopefully. Um, I'm glad you brought up the issue of the living wage because, uh, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is sort of demonstrating in the next 20 or 30 years, a lot of the jobs that are going to be created actually won't require a college degree. So, solving higher ed is not sort of the magic bullet. I mean, 
I just want to say that, you know, I'm a CUNY uh, uh, community college professor, and the issue of funding is so central because I don't think this tuition plan is going to help my students at all. I mean, I have students who, who are missing class because they can't pay for the transit. And, and, and so I think I just want to question is a movement to develop more funding, you know, to, I mean, what are the, I mean, there are students, there are parents, but I mean, Cuomo has done very little for CUNY at all, to be honest. I mean, I just sort of, I'd like to hear sort of what do you think are the social forces out there can sort of really push this state uh, in the direction of sort of more funding for CUNY and SUNY? Yeah. What happens to schools when they're more socioeconomically diverse, mm -hmm. Rick? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, when, when you, you, you want to make sure that there's political capital in support of uh, our public institutions. And uh, right now we, we don't have that. We, you know, there's been a decline at the community college level. There's a decline in the proportion of upper middle class people over time. Uh, and that's, that has disastrous political effects. Uh, I'll just say what our, what our working group is doing at the Century Foundation is to, to try to at least begin the conversation by having a research base for what it costs to provide a decent education. Uh, these types of studies are routine at the K through 12 level. In state after state, they've said, here's what it costs, uh, and here's how much extra money we should pr be providing when there are disadvantaged populations in order to provide genuine equal opportunity. And, and Sarah and I are part of this new project to, to apply that uh, methodology to higher education. Um, once we have the, at least a research base, then there's something for activists to go out and, and rally around. But we don't even have that information right now. So I, I think that's one step. Right. Uh, what you have, or, or you have two challenges, I think. And I've, yeah, I mean, I really, I spent a lot of time in the CUNY system. I really do understand this. One challenge is you, you, don't, have an, you don't have anything to peg a number to. You, all you can say is we need more. Right? You don't really have a, you can't say how far off you are from being adequately funded. Um, ASAP, that's the biggest. Right. Well, yeah, if you could afford ASAP, I mean, you have to put the outlay there. You can get the ROI on it if you can put the money up. It's just a program that works in CUNY that a lot of students can't get, right? right. Which, is, which is creating a lot of anger among them, rightfully so. Um, and then the second thing is you really do lack a robust socioeconomic diversity of families who are fighting for you to have more resources, right? And that was one thing that I, I do posit you might get a little more of from the Cuomo plan, but I'm not holding my breath for it. I, I do want to note, though, and this goes to why Rick is pointing to why this is so important. You all are some of the best resourced in the country. Think about that, right? I go out to, I was in Wisconsin before. Our two-year schools there on a per-student basis are getting $5,000 a head. Then I go out to Oregon, where we did make community college free. They're getting $2,000 a head. What do you even do with $2,000 a head? Right? But that's how these questions have to come up is then you can turn and you can say, you can't do that. I mean, you know what I mean? So I think, that, I think that's a big part of the discussion. Uh, I, there are a few students you have, by the way, who will be able to pay their bills because of the Cuomo plan. There are students who didn't know that they should or could fill out the FAFSA. Okay? And so, and I want to be careful uh, because there are, the idea that no low-income students would benefit from this plan is not right. There's a bunch of them who will benefit. It's not as many as there should be. And you will get disproportionate benefits from the middle class. And no, that's not wasted. Because they're hurting too, and because politically we need them. So last question. Uh, my name is Ross, uh, Ross DeWeese. And um, so I have a question for both of you guys. Um, so I, was, I hear a lot of talk about this word fair from both of you. and. I looked up the definition of fair, which is in accordance with rules or standards, legitimate. So when I think about the rules and standards for our society or for society, um, I think about rent, I think about mortgage, I think about debt culture, which is embodied by like credit cards and car loans. Um, so like in what ways do you see um, in that context uh, your proposal, such as like a free lunch for a 13th and 14th grade, or um, making college free um, uh, fair. Um, so, and then the second question is um, about, because I, I kind of felt like there was an incomplete answer to the, so um, what do you see the role of like mass open online courses, such as like Coursera mm -hmm. or edX in the future of education in general? Well, I'll take that one. I love to talk about MOOCs. 
I think we're. I heard a rumor we're moving beyond them, and there's something called pooks. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I don't know, person centered or something. I don't know. look. I mean, here I, I was skeptical of them from the beginning because what they say they're going to do is expand access to education for people who don't have it. No, that's wrong. Actually, what they're expanding access to education for is people who have a lot of education. So it's great if you finished college and you know you you want to do that maybe instead of grad school or you're just bored at night and you want to you know engage in these. That does seem to be the heavy user who really is getting something out of them. It's just that that has nothing to do with equity. That has to do with learning, which is a good thing, right? But around these questions of equity in a country that's got rising inequality. I, I found it remarkable that, that people started to really put their stock in those. Mm -hmm. Want to take the other yeah, one, the fairness uh, question? Uh, so uh, that's, that's <laughs> the ultimate question. What, how are we going to make this system fair? What is a fair system? And one way to look at it is if we're providing students with equal opportunity to accomplish a certain set of outcomes, graduating from college, you know, becoming uh, middle class citizens. And right now, we ensure that that won't happen because the students who need the most get the fewest resources. That's true in terms of where we allocate money. We give money fewer dollars to community colleges than to four-year institutions. Community colleges are educating more disadvantaged students on average. Uh, four-year institutions are more, more advantaged students. And we're even doing it through financial aid. That's incredible. I mean, the Pell Grant that, that Sarah mentioned earlier is what most people think of when they think of financial aid. Um, and it, it now covers just a fraction of what it used to cover. But what's outpaced the Pell Grant are the tax credits that are provided. Uh, you know, the, there are a number of them. There are the 529 plans uh, where you can uh, have, a, have a tax shelter. Uh, there's the American Opportunity Credit. There are a number of different programs that disproportionately benefit uh, wealthier families. Uh, and they are now bigger than the Pell Grant in terms of our, our expenditures. Uh, and, and even more hidden than all of that are the ways in which our uh, university endowments are not taxed. Uh, there was this fascinating study that said our public subsidies of Princeton are $100,000 per pupil because we don't tax their property, we don't tax uh, their gains in their endowments, and, and because they get enormous overhead for their research, um, as compared to, uh, you know, on the order of $10,000 for, uh, for uh, public two-year institutions in, in New Jersey. Uh, if you look at who goes to Princeton, who goes to community college, we're giving, we're showering all these benefits on the wealthiest people and, um, and the least on the disadvantaged uh, people. And as we become, uh, you know, as we see demographic changes in this country, we have to educate everyone. We can't just be educating the elite anymore. There was a time when, you know, 5% of Americans had a college degree, 1940. Um, we need uh, to revamp the system in the way that Sarah has been, been writing about to make sure that so many more people have access to high quality education. And that would be, that would be a fair system in, in my view. Well, thank you guys all for coming and braving the elements to be mm -hmm. here. Um, and we'd love to continue this conversation with you after this. Um, so there's some wine and cheese in the back. Um, and feel free to, to mingle and to walk around and to ask us further questions. Um, as we